Um, I'm Judith Schein. I'm the director of design for the Tallwood Design Institute and um, a professor of architecture at University of Oregon. And we also have um, with us Ian McDonald, who's the director of Tallwood Design Institute, who is not really sitting in front of our Emerson lab, but um, anyway, that's in the background. Um, so um, as, as Evan said, we, we, um, we've gone virtual, you know, like everything else in the last 18 months. And this has actually been good in certain ways because it's allowed us to expand not only our audience, but um, the presenters who today are presenting, I think from Vancouver, Seattle, and I just heard Oakland, if I'm not mistaken. And, and people listening are, are scattered all around. Before, I'm gonna do very brief introductions for the speakers, but before I do that, I'm gonna say those of you who've been following our recent meetups are probably aware that this is the third one on uh, modular mass timber work that we've been doing. And um, there seems to be a lot of interest in it. I, I Maybe I think that because I'm very interested in it. And um, in my travels through various conferences, I come across these really great presentations and I asked them to come to the meetup. So we had one from Intelligent City uh, a number of months ago, early in the year, um, about their panelized uh, CLT housing project, which they hope to get in the ground this fall up in Vancouver. We had one a few months later by Sidewalk Labs about their component system, which is about much uh, really based on office construction. Well, that's not true. It's office and housing. It's pretty much everything. Um, and uh, this one is um, on modular CLT housing uh, being developed up in up in Washington. And I, I heard um, Ilana and Rachel give um, a presentation, not really one presentation, they kind of gave two different presentations at, a, at the, um, the Future of, of Prefab Symposium organized by a number of Canadian schools that I, I also presented at on modular um, housing in, in the US. And um, it was a great presentation. So I've asked them to uh, present here. So I'm, as you can tell, I'm really looking forward to it. And again, there seems to be a huge amount of interest now in uh, not just modular um, housing and office work and, and various kinds of systems, panelized, component, volumetric, um, but um, particularly with the possibilities that Mass Timber provides. So anyway, um, with that, let me just do brief introductions. Uh, we have Rachel Himes and Joe Swain, both from Methune. And I'm just gonna read these brief uh, bios. Uh, Rachel's an architect at Methune, I guess we know that, with a focus on affordable and sustainable building design using innovative building technologies to achieve equitable and healthy communities. With a background and continued interest in prefabrication and modular construction methodologies, she continues advocacy in the industry for achieving building optimization through prefabrication processes and waste reduction practices. Uh, Joe Swain, architect and project manager at Methune, focused on crossing new construction systems with affordable and multifamily housing. He has an interest in the potential of wood as both an architectural material and a climate stabilization. He has de designed with mass timber for eight years and experienced with many methods of prefabricated construction, including light frame boxes, flat pack mass timber and steel frame modules. He is currently collaborating in a research project investigating the relative carbon impact of modular construction. Uh, and they will be presenting uh, together. And then Alana Donzig is an engineer with Aspect Engineering. And just to put in a plug, uh, Aspect is a member of our REACTS consortium, our industry consortium uh, that works with um, the Tallwood Design Institute. Um, and um, she has over a decade of structural engineering experience and has worked on a wide range of projects in Canada and the US, including, I'll just state it first, the Oregon State University College of Forestry and our own Emerson Lab, um, and uh, the UBC Aquatic Center, the Audain Art Museum, um, uh, a Terminus, and Told One in Langford, um, British Columbia. Experienced in all materials, she is passionate in structural mass timber design and seismic engineering, and her current projects include mass timber buildings ranging from modular, industrial office, and mid to high rise residential. So with that, we're going to turn it over to Rachel and Joe. And we should say, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, and at the end of both presentations, we will, you know, we can take questions from the chat and from people raising their hands and just asking things. So thank you all. Thank you, everybody, for being here, but particularly to Rachel and Joe and Alana. Mm -hmm. All right. Is everybody seeing? The screen okay? Good? Okay. Um, so I'll kick us off here. Thanks, Judith and Evan, for um, our introductions and for allowing us an opportunity to present today. And um, we're always excited to be able to continue to share knowledge 
around mass timber and prefabrication technologies, especially in forums such as this one. So um, today we're gonna be sharing some of our experience with modular mass timber, as Judith mentioned, and more specifically, the volumetric modular approach to prefabrication. So we'll go into detail on a few projects that were developed in partnership with Forterra, who's a local Pacific Northwest nonprofit. Um, and to, to kick us off, I'll say there were many, many, many partners in these projects, a couple of which I know are on the call today. So um, hi, everyone. Um, but today it's gonna be uh, the three of us, uh, Mathune and Aspect. And I'll just quickly, since some people might not know Mathune, um, we are an integrated architecture, interior, and landscape design practice, and we have offices um, all along the, the West Coast, um, and we do a range of project types, but the ones we're going to talk about today really hit a sweet spot for us between um, the affordable high-density housing and the sustainable building material of mass timber. So um, with that... Okay, so we wanted to start um, a little bit big picture, zooming out about why these projects, you know, even exist, and it's it's really about identifying the challenges that we're facing today. Two of focus being the global housing crisis as well as climate change, um, and for Terra, the the local uh, nonprofit. Um, and was our partner for these projects, um, is largely a land conservation organization, but in recent years has begun developing urban land at high densities to avoid urban sprawl and um, obviously re resulting deforestation. So we and our trade colleagues partnered with them to do our part in addressing some of these challenges by utilizing a, a local sustainable material, you know, our, our, our forests, and innovative construction technologies, specifically volumetric modular in this case, um, to achieve attainable housing models in the state of Washington. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an overview. Um, and then when we think about how this model for attainable housing might work, um, you really need to understand the process all the way from harvesting of the material to the manufacturing process, um, to site delivery and ultimately your, your construction erection process. So what's interesting is that um, the projects that we've been working on um, overlay with this process to complete the whole story. So at the top of the page, you have the, the Darrington Wood Innovation Center, um, which we won't touch on too much today, but I think it's an important part of the story. And that includes a sawmill, CLT and glue land factory and a modular factory. Um, and then you have the housing projects that are, are near the Seattle area, specifically um, Wattagere, which is in Tukwila, Washington, and then the modular prototype, which is ultimately testing a, a two-bedroom unit uh, for Wattagere. Um, it's another project we'll discuss today. Yeah, um, and I think we, we'd like to talk about these projects in the context of um, two uh, separate sub-worlds in the construction industry. So um, the first one is um, modular construction in general or prefabricated construction in general, which um, carries with it kind of an expectation of certain efficiencies um, in cost and schedule in, the, um, in uh, kind of delivering the project itself. And um, the second one is kind of the low cost housing, uh, high density housing, um, which is a large part of Methune's practice, but um, is, it, it, uh, is driven by slightly different funding sources than maybe your typical commercial mass timber housing, or uh, sorry, mass timber um, office space, or even your market rate housing. And um, a lot of the early design work, I, I, to put it into uh, some context, involves a lot of um, pitting different construction types and just construction methods against each other to kind of uh, me, um, maximize the unit counts on um, any given parcel of land um, and given you know, building code heights and um, zoning code heights. So um, mass timber, I think, is uh, uh, a challenge, an extra challenge to um, kind of insert into that uh, uh, tight margin space that we're, um, we're working in in affordable housing. 
And um, I and I think we're we're making progress in it, but I'll say that you know uh, it's very difficult when um, uh, some of your key metrics are floor to floor heights and just trying to kind of get an extra story in um, uh, on any given project in order to make it uh, go or no go. So uh, the project uh, on the left, Wadajir, is um, one of the first of a couple of um, multifamily housing. Uh, projects that were was facing that those challenges, uh, and so um, we had a 65 uh, foot height limit, um, which kind of gave us a Type 4C construction, um, and uh, it um, we were looking at five stories of residential, which would all be more or less um, prefab modular, and then uh, one story of commercial on the ground floor. Um, uh, comprising of about 100 residential units. And so we'll talk about those. Uh, not technically affordable, depending on your definition, but they would be HUD funded uh, and meet HUD standards, and um, they would meet the Section 213, so 100% um, cooperative housing. Um, and then uh, after that, we'll talk about um, the modular prototype, which is um, basically just the two bedroom um, prototype uh, study that um, is currently under fabrication right now. And uh, I'd like, uh, I, I think we tried to time this talk so that we would be further along in construction, but um, or completed with construction actually, but uh, some manufacturing and shipping delays kind of pushed it to the fall instead of the summer. So, uh, okay, there we go. Yeah, so uh, as Joe mentioned, Wada's year is going to be the, the first project we talk about. It's, it's the first pilot housing project of a, a series of housing projects. Um, and just to give a little bit of the context and a little bit of the story and why um, Wada's year, the name uh, translates to bonded together in Somali, which was derived um, for both the connected Somali community that this project's going to exist in, and as well as the use of cross-laminated timber in the project. Um, it's located in the uh, just south of Seattle um, in a, a city called Tukwila and has potential to have huge impact to um, this community. So it's a really exciting project. Um, and uh, just to get a sense of the scheme, um, uh, you can see we kind of have uh, five stories of uh, modular, um, volumetric modular uh, housing on top of one um, post and beam podium, essentially, um, that would kind of transfer the loads down to the, um, to the columns. And I'll let uh, Alana talk a little bit more about the structural scheme, but um, the, the overall arrangement is um, kind of the donut arrangement with uh, a fairly narrow courtyard in the center um, and uh, two um, or a double loaded corridor on one side and uh, single loaded on the opposite side, um, which was basically just as constraint of the site. Um, and uh, the, the, the foundation I believe is just um, a mat slab uh, to pick up basically the load since we had um, a lot of columns at the end of the day. So um, you can kind of see that scheme on the left, uh, the ground floor, uh, the blue is representing kind of the retail and commercial and restaurant spaces. Um, and uh, then on the, uh, on the right side in the gold, we've got um, amenities for the residences like a gym, uh, mail lobby and um, kind of a informal gathering space. Um, and then on the upper levels, we essentially um, tried to standardize the, the modules as much as possible. If you guys have uh, sat through um, two um, mass timber module talks already, then you'll know that uh, the there's a strong push to um, kind of keep dimensions the same, keep kitchens and baths the same. And uh, so, uh, as you can see, we worked on a pretty strict grid. Um, the, the site was not particularly favorable for um, uh, kind of uh, a 
having everything aligned. And so, uh, you know, that, that kind of um, the modular ideal breaks down a little bit as you uh, run into corners, um, as you kind of fit in your brace frames, which are the kind of dark bands um, in between. And, um, you know, uh, you kind of have to be creative about sticking uh, services and distribution of utilities in, um, in as well. So uh, as uh, we'll touch on that a little bit more as we move along. Yeah, and then and then when you zoom into um, the individual housing unit scale, you'll see that each bay of the unit is essentially a module. So um, on the left, you have a one bedroom unit that's comprised of two modules. The two bedroom unit is comprised of three modules, et cetera. Um, they're color coded here to represent the program, um, essentially living rooms, um, uh, primary bedrooms and secondary bedrooms. Um, and those modules really extend from the face of the exterior wall um, all the way to the center line of the corridor. So it's got half of the corridor um, in our case. And um, the modular boxes are made to mated together um, kind of in this dark poche area, but they do have openings um, in the CLT walls so that you're traversing through the unit kind of left to right. Um, and then when you zoom in even further to the module scale, um, the modules, Joe alluded to this a little bit, um, they're designed around a very rigorous set of design parameters, um, basically for manufacturing efficiency, replicability, and um, just lowest cost. Um, so in this case, as a baseline, there, there are six different module types that make up the units. Um, they all have the same length, the same width, um, the same height, um, you can see they have the same window fenestration on the exterior wall. Um, we have six, but I think if it was possible, we could have reduced this even further um, to, to, to limit the amount of variations. Um, but I think all of that to say, um, there are definitely conversations happening, um, particularly in Europe and other countries where the modular industry is a, a bit more mature. Um, and it's the conversations they're having are around the standardization of the prefabrication process and some of the opportunities that it presents. So I think at the current expectation is to be highly repetitious um, and replicable for the ease of manufacturing and cost. Um, but I think there are a series of precedents out there that show once standardization of this product and the quality is mastered in the factory, it's possible that it could allow for more design flexibility and um, different amounts of variation between the modules. So, um, you know, your widths could ultimately be uh, different, um, your length could be different, uh, and there'll be some slight, could be some slight um, variation to adapt to different users, contexts, and project needs. Yeah, I'll, and, um... Again, to put this into context of like broader uh, prefabricated work, the emphasis is so strong on replication and um, just kind of having everything standardized. And um, I mean, I think every modular project we've worked on, you know, the cost, um, it, it, the modular um, benefit and cost or budget seems to be pretty great at the beginning. And then as you kind of apply your um, perfect scheme like we just showed in those six boxes before um, to an actual real world site, um, you kind of start to realize that you've got, um, you know, a zillion different con um, conditions that you have to deal with on almost every single um, slot. So, um, you know, those six boxes, uh, we definitely needed them to stack. So every single floor uh, of residential is exactly the same, just so you can run utilities uh, vertically. Um, but then uh, if you kind of um, look at, say, where we put some brace frames, which would need to be protected for fire, where you have corner units, which need extra um, protection on the exterior wall, um, if you have a stairwell next or a um, single loaded or a double loaded corridor, every one of those variations is um, 
uh, would probably be counted against you as an inefficiency in the manufacturing process. So um, when all is said and done, I think on the next slide, uh, we have, uh, we, we kind of itemized them out in that those neat six uh, box types um, actually turned into 54 separate um, boxes that, you know, for the most part, yes, it's six different box types, but, um, you know, each one of them uh, almost, or I guess, I guess you should say almost over half of them needed one treatment here or a different treatment at some point, which would make it unique. Um, let's see, and on the next slide, um, yeah, and uh, just um, to touch a little bit on permitting, um, also, I think, uh, I, I'll say at least in Washington state, permitting of prefabricated or factory built modular is um, not straightforward, uh, mainly because I think the, the system is kind of catching up to uh, multifamily um, uh, project types where it was designed for say, maybe a, more on the mobile home scale, um, but you basically need to have uh, anything that's manufactured in a factory, like the, uh, the yellow orange um, uh, color here, everything um, that's factory built would be permitted and re reviewed, permitted and inspected by uh, Washington State Labor and Industries. And um, anything that's uh, fabricated on site or installed on site is the local jurisdiction. And so it requires a really careful coordination between um, permit submittals. Um, the timelines are can usually be concurrent, but they don't necessarily end up that way. Uh, so, um, you know, this is yet kind of another hurdle that uh, requires the entire building to pretty much be figured out from top to bottom um, very early on just to uh, kind of keep the design schedule moving. And then we wanted to talk a little bit about the prototype. Um, you know, the, the prototype was ultimately a project that evolved from, you know, needing to test at a one-to-one -one full scale, um, uh, a, a two bedroom unit prior to wattage year being um, fully mass produced and erected. Um, and so the mock-up includes a, a two bedroom unit. So that's three modules um, inclusive of a single loaded corridor. And those modules are about 12 feet wide with an eight foot nine ceiling, clear ceiling height. Um, these dimensions were mostly driven by unit sizes in the region, but also the span limitations of the CLT. Um, and you can see kind of in this plan view that each module has the same structural shell on all six sides. Um, th those are structural load bearing walls. Um, and then Alana will talk a little bit more about that. But we've also got interior CLT walls. Those are thinner, non-structural. Um, and then we've really limited the stud framed construction to just the, the corridor wall um, and wet wall, the shared wall between the corridor and the wet wall. Um, and so from a unit planning perspective, um, because we have this wet wall running vertically through the building along the corridor, the location of services um, is uh, feeding each unit and thus, you know, for planning purposes, a lot of your appliances, your plumbing fixtures um, are required to be along that wet wall for optimal efficiency. And then if we turn that, this prototype on its side, um, it doesn't actually have modules stacking above and below it. It's just a one story, um, two bedroom unit. But this begins to show that six-sided CLT box a bit better. Um, and because it's a type 5C construction, um, we're able to expose most of the CLT within the unit. There's only one wall in each module that's required to have one to two layers of, of jit board at the load bearing mate walls, um, and that's for fire protection. Um, and so you can, you can see in this diagram as the module stack, there's uh, approximately a two inch gap um, and kind of 
that was driven by routing of conduit and, and kind of the construction tolerance. Um, but that's ultimately filled with mineral wool that's, that's part of the factory built scope. Um, you can also see here the um, wet wall um, includes all of the MEP services to the module. Um, from a, a modular perspective, the most efficient system approach uh, to prefab is quite different than some more traditional approaches. And so it involves the majority of vertical distribution, which limits crossover between the modules, um, as well as horizontal distribution of decks to the exterior facade. Um, and so really the only vertical connections between sy systems and modules is, is very limited. Um, and then that occurs both vertically and if there is any horizontal connection, that those will occur on site, not in the factory. Um, and so this di is diagrammatically kind of how that wet wall comes together. It really does involve an integrated design process. Um, we learned this very quickly. Um, and it needs to happen very early in the project through 3D BIM coordination with all of the trades, your modular manufacturer, and um, getting your consultant team to, to rethink the level of detail and design that um, they would provide in a typical project, um, and getting fabricators input on some constructability and, and part, of the, part of the manufacturing process. Because um, each, each penetration into the seal into the CLT walls needs to be coordinated and, and very precise. Um, I think the plan, especially for the prototype, is for it to be used effectively as a teaching tool for various subcontractors, different trades, to, to test how they can make these connections between modules prior to um, the erection of the or full building at Lodigeer. There are a lot of connections. I should say also the sprinklers um, uh, themselves, um, just by code, can't really conform to that uh, vertical um, vertical uh, scheme so that every mod gets its own sprinkler system. It, you kind of have to tie it off um, to every floor. And so, um, yeah, the, the number of connections needed to be made in the field is um, definitely not trivial. And uh, I'll speak a little bit more about that. Actually, um, we just because of the um, non-standard construction, um, we do we did need to basically build our own fundamentals on um, code compliance, so that we we had to um, do uh, fire tests and also acoustic tests of the assemblies. Um, we have tested. Uh, we've run some fire tests that were mainly the panels themselves and then the full assemblies are um, I believe waiting in the wings to be tested once we uh, once the um, fabricated panels arrive um, but uh, I think you know when you're going through um, what Washington State labor and industries to get your um, building permits basically um, you basically have to prove that uh, every um, assembly is going to meet the, the two hour requirement in this case. For example, we've got two hour uh, demising walls or load bearing walls, I should say, because even the walls in between two bedrooms in the same unit would need uh, two hours. Um, floor ceiling as well, uh, all uh, per the type four construction code, uh, type construction. Code. Um, and then uh, also between floors, uh, we were shooting for a S, TC and IIC of um, 55 each. So, um, uh, but ultimately we just needed to prove that we are um, meeting code on those. Um, so the, the current um, plan actually is once the mods are created, we will actually build what uh, we're looking at before, like a half mod on top, um, just to uh, execute a floor ceiling, uh, acoustic test. Um, and uh, just to kind of orient you a little bit more to this kind of key detail, uh, this is four mods all at their junction. Um, I guess I'd labeled these wrong, but mods three and four would go in first. They'd have this uh, plywood spline that uh, bridges across them at the top. And then um, 
I'll, I'll let uh, Alana talk a little bit more about the system, but uh, then the mods on top would be supported in the case of two hours of fire by one side or the other, um, plus a cantilevered piece of um, plywood that is that spline. So that spline is doing double or triple duty as tying the diaphragm together and also um, kind of load uh, taking on some load in the case of a fire. Um, so uh, we are um, basically going to test that wall assembly and the juncture assembly. If you go to the next slide, um, this is kind of uh, what that test would look like uh, with um, essentially a full mod bridging over the or mod floor ceiling bridging over the furnace with uh, two of those um, two of those junctions and two of those splines. Um, and uh, that would be tested unloaded um, just to kind of make sure that our basic assumptions are correct and that this will this um, the system will work in two hours of fire. And uh, on the in our next test, we would test the full floor assembly as loaded. Um, and uh, we would have kind of an, uh, uh, a bridged version of that junction detail just to make sure that we would get the correct, um, the, the, the loading, um, the loads would be picked up from the, uh, from the floor panel if the ceiling panel burned away. Um, and then on the next, uh, after that, assuming all goes well, uh, we are going to test the, uh, the wall assembly alone as lo uh, loaded. Um, and then um, because our, our exterior walls are also mass timber, uh, we'll need to run a uh, NFPA 285 test on the exterior assembly. Um, and uh, I know David Berber's on the call on this. So if you have any questions about that, it sounds very difficult to pass. And he is advising us on how to actually do that. So that will be a very exciting follow up if, um, if that works out. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll also say just kind of on the, um, on the fire tests and acoustic tests, um, the, the fire, we, we had to have Hilti give us about, I, I believe there were 19 engineering judgments um, to kind of establish that the, our penetration details of, uh, you know, conduit pipes, ducts going through all of these new assemblies, or I should say untested assemblies will work um, uh, for the fire ratings that they have. Um, and uh, hopefully we won't need any more EJs for the assemblies themselves once we get the tests. But um, again, just uh, there's a lot of extra paperwork just to basically, you know, document um, a seemingly simple system. Um, and uh, then also I wanted to share a couple of details we developed that um, have as much to do with the architecture and just the way the, the building appears on uh, in, you know, in elevation on the site. Um, but when you get down to it, it comes down to how you fasten and close up these, these modules. Um, and so at the top, there's a uh, section detail where we've got um, uh, two mods stacked uh, at the exterior wall. And we would kind of, um, the, dark, the dark green and the red uh, brake metal would be uh, applied on site to kind of um, continue the, wa the waterproofing barrier or the air barrier and, um, and uh, the rain screen. And then uh, same thing down below. That's um, that's in plan. You're kind of looking at what it would look like between two mods that are um, adjacent. They'd be closed up with uh, some mineral wool and um, and some uh, closure pieces in between these kind of uh, exaggerated uh, brake metal fins. That would actually also help kind of protect the mods as they get shipped. Uh, but as you can see on the left, there's uh, um, I didn't bother counting, but there's a lot of patches patching up to do on site once they actually arrive. And uh, I think, on our, and so um, I guess all that goes to just show that, like you know, in this rendering, which uh, is not exactly what it would look like, but you know, it's kind of the idea we've been working toward, which is kind of keeping a very clean floor, uh, 
wall and ceiling uh, to express the wood and um, you know have these great big uh, windows that um, kind of are all fitting nicely in this prefabricated box. There's a lot of detail and um, kind of uh, figuring out the, the um, down to like the millimeter where every wire and every, um, every pipe is gonna go just to kind of preserve this uh, experience. Uh, so I think we'll kind of wrap it up by um, just saying, um, you know, in, in reflection, uh, I think we will have probably more to say once these actually get built and we kind of go through the construction administ administrative process completely. But, um, you know, we, we're, we're trying to uh, take advantage of the benefits um, that the building code allows now that um, we have the type four construction. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, applying it to this, this typology, like high density affordable housing uh, does kind of, um, you know, you're always under this pressure um, to compare it to other construction types. And, you know, could you get another le uh, level or some more units with one construction type or another? And, um, you know, I think that, uh, that that'll be the question we'll have to answer going ahead. Um, if this were to succeed, um, you know, code compliance and inspections are a lot more than just your standard um, stick frame construction or steel and con concrete. And, um, you know, you have to kind of maybe do your own acoustic tests or analyses, and that goes uh, doubly so for fire and fire protection and covering your, all your bases with um, the, the penetrations. Um, yeah, and then and then when it comes to the the manufacturing process, um, mass timber does lend itself to extreme precision, precision that um, we we're talking about in our coordination, and you're able to achieve very minimal tolerances. Um, the CLT boxes are also designed more like a product that can be mass produced and again replicated across various sites, different projects, different configurations. But um, you know, there's some other considerations related to manufacturing that may not always be seen as benefits. Um, we talked a little bit about them involving the factory built efficiencies. There's the ideal world of only a few module types um, for maximum efficiency, but when you apply those real world conditions, um, context that all ultimately gets impacted. Um, there's also the shift in thinking early in the design stages and detailing coordination, both with the manufacturer and your subcontractors, that it, it really takes a, a shift in thinking and, and getting everyone on board with that early, early in the project. Um, and then, you know, finally, we're using wood, we're using mass timber. So there are so many benefits to that, specifically um, a couple we've listed here, you've got just the natural aesthetic of the exposed wood. And with that comes inherent biophilic qualities that improve overall uh, well being of its occupants. Um, and then, you know, you have reduced carbon emissions by using um, mass timber as well. Yeah, well, yeah, and we'll, um, we, we want to clarify that it all depends on where your wood comes from. And I'm sure a lot of people Good have point. opinions on this, but um, the the amount of wood in these projects, if you even compare it to a stick frame modular, is uh, multiple times the amount of fiber volume. And so um, we, yeah, uh, I think uh, it's especially important for us to make sure that our wood sourcing is uh, from sustainable forestry. Um, I think we should uh, turn it over to Alana to, um, uh, elaborate. Thanks, Joe and Rachel for that. Um, is everyone seeing my right screen, the presentation? Yep. Awesome. Volume's okay? Okay, cool. Um, so thank you for that uh, presentation. Um, and thank you to Judith and Evan for inviting us all here. Um, I'm really excited to speak about this project um, and this, this suite of projects and type of projects. Um, I've been working really closely with Rachel and Joe uh, on the Wattagir and the Mod Pro projects. And I'm 
hoping to bring a, a bit of a different perspective on these from kind of the mass timber industry focused perspective, as well as a very structural heavy perspective. So apologize to those of you not structural engineers in this audience. Um, and we'll kind of look at the concepts and I'm going to back up a little bit and look at the, what the industry is doing right now and then uh, what prefab means in the context of, of our industry at the moment. Uh, and then I'll kind of, I'll jump back into these projects. So, there we go. Um, so mass timber buildings are uh, interesting. All mass timber buildings are prefabricated. Mass timber as a product is a prefabricated product, just like uh, steel and precast concrete. And unlike cast in place concrete and unlike most, but not all lightwood frame. Um, so like all of the regular projects we see though, they're all custom designed for the site, for the client, for the location or for the purpose um, and they're all custom. And the things that they need to be successful is the coordination and the erection uh, speed and um, careful trade interfacing, detailing, that's all what we need to be focusing on for these prefab buildings, but at like a much, much higher degree. Um, what we're doing in the prefab buildings is we're trying to cover all of our bases or many of our bases by developing a system that can be repeatable rather than solving every building as if it's a brand new problem. And that turns out to be a surprisingly challenging uh, thing to overcome for our industry. Meanwhile, uh, from the developer and owner side, we're starting to see really significant interest and in clear preference for timber up to the 12 story range in Canada and the US, um, not across the board. There's certainly some regions and some owners and developers who are grabbing onto this earlier, but we're seeing a lot of that. It's becoming a lot more commonplace. And within that world, we're also starting to see RFPs that are, that are mandating offsite prefabrication. So we're seeing this interest on the owner developer side as well to start thinking about prefabrication early in the, in the process. Um, and with that, think about the buildings as systems and, and products rather than individual design problems that you're solving each building. And um, many of us are also looking to Europe as, uh, as Rachel and Joe mentioned, Europe is, is definitely more mature in this industry. And, and with all of that together, we see the industry starting to move towards this integrated prefabrication. Um, and, and we're starting to see mass timber come into that as well and mass timber as a, as a viable option. So I, I said integrated prefab uh, a moment ago. We're saying that this is uh, developing a highly repeatable, integrated and efficient building system, factory built and flexible enough to suit a range of jurisdictions, owners, and local conditions. I've highlighted repeatable and flexible. Uh, those two words are kind of pulling the design team uh, in two different directions. And that's where the tension is on these projects and the challenge is on these projects to, um, to be able to handle both of those dualities. So from a kind of conventional versus integrated perspective, uh, a conventional building is made up of a series of materials and products uh, that are all pretty much custom designed uh, for that building, for that site. Custom pieces, custom cladding, custom NEP, a design team starting from scratch. With integrated prefab, we're trying to move into solving this problem um, for bigger components or an entire building. So we have um, wet wall systems that includes MEP um, that's solved on a greater scale. We have entire modules like bathroom modules, um, structural systems that might be engineered and tested to a higher degree than we'd see otherwise. Um, and, and yeah, other, other kind of modular bigger picture components. And then, uh, Joe has mentioned uh, volumetric and, and flat pack and those two different concepts. And those are the sort of the broad categories that we see in the prefab world. Uh, volumetric is the shipping container approach and the boxes. And that's what, what the Wattagier and Mod Pro 
approaches. And then the flat pack is the uh, panels and pieces. And it, it differs from conventional, say, mass timber construction, which is also panels and pieces, because the flat pack is, is uh, panels that are integrated with other services and possibly finishes. Um, and pre-designed and pre-engineered systems that are meant to fit together. Uh, volumetric and flat pack are, are two options. One is not um, necessarily better than the other. They both have their um, opportunities and their drawbacks. With volumetric, you can ship a finished module and the goal is to finish it to as high a degree as possible. So you're doing as little site work as possible. Um, whereas flat pack, the degree of finish may not be as high. It's a little more time to, to put together on site, but the shipping is way more efficient because you're not shipping a whole bunch of air. You're, you can pack it all together. Uh, for those of you who saw the Sidewalk Labs um, meetup that was a couple of months ago, the Sidewalk Labs takes a flat back approach, uh, just a, a different approach to achieve kind of the same broad goals. So we'll be focusing, or I'll be focusing on this, uh, the volumetric approach today, which is where we're going with Forterra. So a couple of our projects, um, just a, a teaser on the sidewalk. We're uh, deeply involved with sidewalk, sidewalk, and I'm not going to get into it today because that's not, well, first of all, that's not my project portfolio, but also I know uh, Stephen Painter presented on this a couple of months ago to a high degree of interest, and it's a fascinating project. It takes a different approach. We've got a project in Seattle um, very similar to the Forterra project, which is CLT volumetric modular, um, three-story townhouses. We're working on a system that's being developed in BC that is uh, a, another flat pack system, um, leaning more towards lightwood frame, but very similar approach and style to this work we're doing with Forterra, just in terms of the process we're taking and the, the time and energy upfront that's being spent on it. And then finally, the Wadajir project in Tukwila that I'll uh, spend some time on. So I'm gonna be talking about some of the challenges um, of these projects in general, but how we address them with Wadajir and Mod Pro specifically. So this is sort of the outline for the rest of my presentation today. Um, I'll talk about a little bit about the prototype development, the importance of consistency, um, seismic. I think as, a, as an engineer on the West Coast, I can't help myself from including a seismic discussion in here. Um, and the seismic challenges of connecting these systems are really, really interesting. Um, I'll talk about the double structure. When you have these modules, you have walls that are essentially doubled in the floor ceiling that makes could make double the structure, and that adds a whole lot of wood to the project. Um, exposing the CLT, unit sizes, connection detailing, a little bit about fabrication and erection, and a little bit about the factory in Darrington. Um, as, as Joe and Rachel mentioned, we're not as far in the construction of the prototype as we wanted to be for this, this talk. Uh, so a lot of what you're going to be seeing are uh, our models and shop drawings and, and the like, rather than the photos of the thing coming together. So prototype uh, for these projects is really important. Um, you have such an intensive design and concept pro process with these, these uh, modular projects. Uh, again, as Joe and, and Rachel said, all parties are at the table really early and you really need to lean on that heavy integration and heavy coordination. And it takes years sometimes in developing these systems. So doing an early prototype lets you um, get some of the testing out of the way. It also gets a lot of the lessons learned out of the way before you're doing that on a, on a building. Um, it's also an opportunity for for uh, the trades to learn and marketing and promo. And that's what Mod Pro is being used for. Um, it's gonna be traveled around, each individual module is gonna be um, put on a truck, traveled around, and then they'll be parked as a, put together as a, the two bedroom unit on various sites. Um, but what we're really looking for and what we've already seen out of the shop drawing and coordination process is a lot of 
uh, figuring things out that we will do differently next time for Wattagier and things like parts of the process we need to fix, um, what didn't quite work we, the way we thought it would and that sort of thing. Uh, consistency is another major consideration and challenge that we need to uh, address here. Uh, Joe explained it really well with the number of module types and the number of different modules we have. Um, it takes so much rigor to put together a floor plan that uses as few modules as possible and not just modules, but the site built elements. So the, the weird areas. Um, what I've shown here is we have green as the double loaded corridor and blue as the single loaded corridor. So those are the two broad module types that we kept throughout. And um, from a structural perspective, those are the two types that are really structurally different from each other. So those are any modeling or testing or design or uh, structural engineering that we do has to be done on both of those. And we're not wanting to repeat, you know, we don't want 200 different uh, finite element models of these modules, we want to limit that for, for that repeatability. So the orange here is the, is the weird, that's the site built, that's the thing we can't modularize, um, and that's really constrained on this floor plan. I think this is a great floor plan for, for this sort of building. Um, and the, the cores themselves, the red boxes, those will be uh, uh, modules in their own, like custom modules that are prefab and uh, placed on site. So the site built is the thing that we want to absolutely minimize on these projects. So getting to seismic, um, seismic is always going to be a driver on the West Coast for any structural project. These projects, I, I, I think that's amplified. It becomes a huge um, factor in how the structure works. If we were somewhere in the gray area, it would be a very different story. As soon as we're governed by wind, we can stop thinking about ductility so much. Um, but on the West Coast, in those pink areas, we can be, the forces can be 10 times higher and we're looking at failure modes and we're looking at um, code compliance and we're looking at all sorts of restrictions and uh, it becomes very challenging. The reason is we have stacking boxes um, where we have all these constraints because of the system that we're using. So we need to minimize how much work we're doing on site. We know that the whole advantage of the system is to be, to focus the work and the effort in the factory for very fast direction. But we need to connect everything to the foundation. We have, we want to have little or no access from inside the modules. We want everything to be installed from outside the modules because these modules are meant to be finished and we don't wanna mess with those finishes. We don't wanna leave out finishes for structural connections later. Um, we also need diaphragms and we have a floor panel and a, and a, or a, floor, a floor panel and a ceiling panel coming together at each interface. So how do we connect these together? What serves as the diaphragm? If it's the floor panel, what's the ceiling panel doing and vice versa? And then each element we need to connect vertically uh, for, for rocking load transfer and also for shear load transfer. So that's quite a, um, a list of requirements. This is our framework that we use uh, formally or informally for a lot of these systems is what is our lateral system? So the obvious choice is CLT because we have CLT boxes um, and CLT checks a lot of the boxes we need it to check. It, it does work as a lateral system, but CLT can be a shear wall technically. Um, however, ductility tends to be quite low with the technologies and connectors we have at the moment. Um, CLT, it, if I go kind of down the, the row of what's important, it's highly prefabricated, not code approved everywhere. In fact, in very few places, um, although it's not necessarily a hard thing to get uh, approved by authorities um, and very tight tolerances and it's just a natural fit except for the lack of ductility. Um, if we look then at a steel or a concrete lateral system, um, steel really stands out as the right choice for its not only ductility but it's, it, it matches wood and CLT in its prefabrication and its tolerances. 
whereas concrete, you don't get the prefabrication, you have to build it in advance. You don't have the same tolerances. Interfacing CLT and concrete is always um, a bit of a challenge. So we, we very strongly feel that steel is, um, tends to be the right choice when we're looking at hybrid lateral systems. Um, also for the, for the uh, embodied carbon uh, consideration, we try to reduce the concrete in these buildings. So for low rise modular buildings that we look at in high seismic or low seismic zones, we will use CLT shear walls, we'll accept the low ductility provided we're allowed to with the, uh, provided the authority having jurisdiction will accept CLT shear walls. Um, but what we found is greater than three stories or maybe four stories um, in the West Coast, this is going to be extremely challenging. The lows are going to be immense. Um, the hold downs are going to be nuts. The, uh, the amount of shear wall we'll need will be unacceptable for these buildings. So we're, we're doing it on this, on this Seattle project with three stories and it's manageable. Um, four stories, maybe five, I, I just wouldn't touch it. Um, and even so, with these, with the low ductility, you get really high demands on the diaphragm and high demands on the foundation, and the cost of the detailing and the cost of the rest of the structure starts to climb. So what we're looking at for the mid-rise, high-rise, and that's where Wattagere falls in here, is pairing the CLT module boxes with a steel eccentrically braced frame, where we get the really good ductility. Um, we keep the modules disconnected laterally, and that presents its whole host of structural challenges. Um, but that's what we need to do to make sure that the braced frame can take the load because the CLT can be so stiff. And then we use the ceiling as the diaphragm, the ceiling of all the, of all the modules as they get dropped in, they get connected together on site and the load gets dragged into the steel braces. So this comes with a lot of tricky detailing, a lot of modeling. Um, it's a really neat engineering problem to solve, um, but this is what we end up with. And then moving away from seismic and looking at kind of the geometry and the structural interfaces and how we came up with how this interface works. Um, we spent a ton of time in the early, early days just looking at this detail and figuring out what bears on what and you know, what do the floor panels do and do we do cross grain loading? Do we avoid cross grain loading? Um, what we ended up with is the long walls along the modules are the bearing walls. The short walls are not carrying any bearing load. It's just the long walls. And those ones sit one on top of the other. So we don't have any cross grain bearing, which reduces, um, it, we don't have, we, we reduce crushing. We don't have as much uh, settlement of the building over time from shrinkage or, or deformation. And it allows this building to be able to um, be developed up to 12 stories high. It's also uh, really great for fabrication. We worked closely with the fabricator on how their setup is and how they install each piece and what's possible and what's not possible for the fabrication process. Um, and early days for this, we were working with Kunzli, and now we're working with Saug on this. And then the plywood spline is the site installed element that ties everything together. It connects the one module to the next. It provides our diaphragm. And I'll show on the next slide, it also provides a load transfer. If there's a fire, um, we have some fire protection from that. So in developing this, detail that two hour fire scenario was, was uh, one of the major design drivers. So the, the client for Terra wanted to have some of the timber exposed um, as part of the uh, living environments. So the idea here is because we have so much material, uh, because each box, we can't go below a certain size and still have connections work and still have um, the kind of strength and stiffness that we need, we can allow basically one layer in the wall, in the, in the floor ceiling assembly and one layer in the double wall to be sacrificial. And then that double structure becomes beneficial instead of wasteful. It becomes part of the fire protection system. So if we have a fire in one module, the ceiling is sacrificial and one wall is sacrificial and the plywood spline 
is transferring the load at each level um, to the remaining wall that can handle the, the residual load in the fire load case. Uh, this is a key element that we're testing, uh, but the engineering and the, and the design and the concepts are solid. So we're confident that this is um, going to be a good approach. And as uh, Rachel and Joe outlined, the geometry and integration was really important. Both um, setting the modules at the 12 foot width was really important to suit the market uh, requirements for these units. Um, 10 foot from a structural perspective was ideal because of CLT sizes that are easily available. So with the 12 foot, we couldn't reliably get a, a panel, whether it's a spandrel panel or not, a CLT panel to, to, to span the full width of the, of the module and create a floor or ceiling panel. And that would have been ideal and most efficient for, for factory production, but the width just didn't quite make it and shipping constraints of the CLT were also more challenging. So we turned the panels um, around and added a bunch of splines, which from a factory perspective was not, um, they weren't too concerned about that as, as a huge cost factor here, but this is where the module width really drove that um, design and requirement. Um, meanwhile, the, the corridor early in early days, we were back and forth and debating whether the corridor was part of the uh, Part of the module or the corridor was site built and how the corridor worked and uh, we found a way to make the corridor part of the module so the module includes the unit and the, the, the end corridor as well so you're shipping fewer things um, and it's just a, a one piece you integrate the wet wall so much better if it's part of it and then all of that comes together and is coming together in the shop drawings and the modeling and the coordination um, making sure that all our openings are where we needed our openings to be. Uh, the panels that were designed, we had uh, 105 millimeter ceiling panels or 103, I can't remember, and 139 millimeter floor panels. And these were really like designed right down to the line with the openings taken into account. So there's no extra meat or allowance on typical projects, you, you know, you find out um, way down the line that there's openings required in the panels and CLT is usually pretty good and flexible about accommodating those sorts of things. Here, in order to make this an efficient system, it had to be so um, carefully and precisely designed there that having those exact openings early on was critical. Every time an opening changed, we're checking the floor, we're checking the ceiling, we're making sure everything works again. So that early integration, having the mechanical uh, design builder involved early, it matters so much on these projects. And it's so that when we get here to the shop drawings and the coordination, it brings it all together, but we shouldn't be having surprises at this stage. And this is again, where the prototype is really critical because if we are having surprises and we did have a few surprises on this, we know where in the design process that happened and what to do about it next time so that it's not happening for the building at a much, much, much bigger scale. And for connection detailing on these projects, the, um, the level of like the different cases and, and loading conditions to consider are so much more than on a typical structural, on a typical building. Um, we're, we're considering these modules in transportation, we're considering them in fabrication, we're considering lifting loads and, and how they work and how they wanna warp when they're being lifted, in addition to all the usual live and dead load and seismic and, and fire and, and whatnot. Uh, the connection approach is pretty much all self-tapping screws and then at the splines we're using screws and nails and that's it. So we're keeping it very simple from a, from a hardware point of view um, with some key drivers. Of, we need to make sure that anything shop installed, it works in the shop with how they're setting this up, how they're building it. Anything site installed gets installed from the exterior only. We don't need in unit access for, for any connections. And then making sure that we coordinate with 
uh, the fire design, with the acoustic design, um, how the connections are impacting these things. So right now, as we speak, we're in the middle of designing a lifting frame and really tuning into the lifting approach for how these are going to be lifted, whether it's in the factory when there's two cranes lifting them or it's outside when there's a single pick point. Um, the, the load distribution and loading ends up ended up being surprisingly like this was a, a fairly big study of, of understanding how the different modules are going to be behave when they're being lifted and making sure that we're um, considering the the different conditions and then with lifting you get into the OSHA the health and safety uh, requirements which moves away from the IBC requirements and OSHA uses factor of safety and IBC uses load and resistance factor and those two systems don't speak well to each other. Um, so this has been a fun um, rabbit hole for us. And on site, which we're um, eager to get to for Wattagear and the, the things that we're starting to uh, work with the team on or that we will be working with the team on are um, how, how this gets uh, placed, how, what the protection of the modules during the erection are, what happens if and when it's raining, how much surface area is exposed. Um, is an entire story going up at once or is it in, in parts or quadrants depending on the size? And then the, the structural site connections have to be coordinated with all of that in addition to the, the final envelope. So the final part that I'll be um, discussing is, is the factory component. And here really is where we see Europe having the advantage and, and leading the way with uh, several large fabricators in, in Europe and, and specifically Switzerland using some really advanced um, robotic manufacturing. And we just aren't, aren't seeing that in North America yet. And this is what Darrington is hoping to start to bring in um, really specific factories for this sort of construction. Um, there's a few factories here in North America that, that are starting to do building products. And there's some people who are doing this work as well, but this sort of automation we don't really see yet. Um, and it, it's really advancing the industry. And this is where um, we have a, one of our offices in, is in Switzerland and that for this industry and for this, at this moment, that sort of feels like our superpower because having a close ear on what's happening in Europe is just so um, critical at the moment and helping us to connect sort of the key players. The Darrington Wood Innovation Center is going to be one of these unifying elements of this project um, to be able to have this offsite fabrication happen in dedicated uh, facilities. Um, this is a just uh, the, the outline of the buildings shown in the forest, of course, surrounding Darrington. Um, the wood is right here, the, the, the fiber is right here. So the, this, this center is going to be uh, include a CLT and glue lamb manufacturing factory, uh, a modular factory, a sawmill kilns boiler, and then all of the support and lay down areas and storage and, and whatnot to support this site. So this work is uh, in design, uh, moving rapidly towards permit as we speak. So we won't have the factory up and running for uh, the Mod Pro construction, but hopefully for the Wattagere construction, the modules get built in the modular factory. So to kind of wrap this up with a bow on what we've learned and what we're learning as an industry and, and us as Aspect and, and me myself, um, is not to underestimate the development, the, the complexity and cost of developing these systems. It's not, um, it's not, these aren't easy problems to solve. If they were, they would be solved. Um, they, they need time dedicated to them to first clearly define the variables. What are we trying to do? And then be rigorous in applying them. Um, I don't think that that modular construction is the answer to the construction industry's woes. Uh, broadly speaking, I don't think it'll solve all problems, but I think certain problems 
and particularly certain kind of residential buildings, it can be um, a really good solution for. It just takes some learning. Uh, I also think that mass timber and, and this sort of prefabrication go really, really well together. I think it's important as to echo what Joe said, it's really important that we um, design as efficiently as we can because the, the more conservative we design, the more fiber we're using. And the purpose of this isn't to shove a whole bunch of unnecessary mass timber into these buildings. Um, it is to produce uh, good quality, rapid construction using uh, as low a carbon footprint as possible. And then just the, the, this idea of um, R&D in our industry um, can be so hard to justify this kind of exploration, these kinds of heavy duty studies. Um, people are risk adverse, this seems risky, but I know me personally and many others here have projects and have had projects that have gone off the rails as well. So the idea here is um, we're trying to catch that, we're trying to fix that. Uh, have this opportunity in this, this place for these um, smoother, faster, more efficient um, projects. And that's all I've got. So thank you so much for, for listening. And I hope there's some questions. And uh, I think I'll invite Joe and Rachel to uh, join me if there are in answering them. Well, I, I want to thank all of you, all three of you. That was really great and very comprehensive. And um, it is clear from the three um, presentations we've had, Intelligent City, um, Sidewalk Labs, and the um, and this project, um, that it, there's a staggering amount of R&D that has to go into them. Um, and um, as I, I think, Alana, as you said, several years or more sometimes of development, which is anyway, it's very interesting. And we, um, you said it doesn't work for all projects, but whatever R&D you do, we hope will pay off in future projects of whatever type, you know, whether whether it's volumetric module or other things, other forms of, mo of modular design. We hope the R&D will apply to many projects in the future. So, um, are there, um, we've had a couple of comments, fantastic presentation. Thanks a lot Rachel and Joe. Are there questions from the audience? If not, um, I thought I'd ask a, a permitting question. And, and Joe, this is probably for you. Um, you said something about, um, you know, meeting HUD standards and that the modules had to be improved by the Bureau of, of Labor in Washington in the factory. So what I'm wondering is, do they also get um, approved by a building inspector and a, and a building authority in Seattle to meet IBC standards? Or is that only for the non-modular non, um, non parts of the building? Uh, that's only for the non-modular parts. You, you, you essentially kind of create a list of every single component um, in the project and it get, is delineated by which inspector sees what. And that's um, how the jurisdictions basically work together. So uh, in theory, if there's nothing that is uh, installed in say a bedroom or something like that on site, then the inspector would not need to go into there um, except in the factory, which would be a different jurisdiction. Right, but, but the factory inspection, is that inspected to meet IBC standards, for example? Yes, or uh, Washington State Building Code, yeah. But which would meet itself IBC standards, yeah. Exactly, it, and, and this is kind of where it gets a little messy because you know mm -hmm. if you're trying to meet Seattle building code as opposed to Washington state building code, the, the, the reviewers are not necessarily up on everything. Um, you know, gen generally it's the same, but um, again, you kind of have to hold, I, or in my experience, you've had to hold everybody's hand basically. <laughs> More coordination. So there mm -hmm. is a, a question in the in the chat from Jeff Morrow, which is um, how heavy are the modules? Alana, maybe this is a question for you. It probably it is. I just don't have the answer to that right now. I'm sorry. Um, I don't have that from the top of my head right now. They're heavy. They're heavy, right? <laughs> okay, but um, possibly if you do have that information somewhere and send it to us, Jeff. Yeah. 
we can I coordinate can. an answer somehow. Yes, the, there is an answer. There is an answer. The answer exists, <laughs> right, which is very important. <laughs> Always the case. Um, and there's another one um, here um, from Adam Slivers. What wood species will be used? Did you consider lesser value species for lighter loaded walls or non-structural walls? It's a good question. Um, we're generally speaking, well, entirely, we're looking at CLT that's going to be PRG certified. Um, so that might rule out certain species. For the non-load bearing walls, I don't think we've looked at, I think we're doing SPF for everything, uh, if I remember. I don't think we've looked at kind of lower grade. We, we've accepted that those ones, because of the size and depending on the producer, they may not be PRG 320 certified. Um, but I don't think we've looked at other products. We also have to use what's available by suppliers. So if, if a supplier isn't producing a lower quality or lower grade or, or a, a different material CLT, we can't use it. Um, it's a different story when Darrington is up and running and producing CLT. Um, and, and that might be a really great option to save some cost and save some, some uh, material. Just as a side to that, um, I think that kind of goes along with the precision point. Um, Alana, if we had to like um, switch manufacturers at the last minute, essentially, mm -hmm. right? And um, if I remember correctly, one the 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 new manufacturer didn't offer the the same thickness, and we had to basically adjust all our models by like three millimeters or something. Yeah, so, yeah. That's where it comes back to bite you. Yeah. A lot of R and D. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get this next question right. This is from Ike A, um, uh, and um, he says innovative designs. This is based on or emulates container units. Question: um, Seismic waves are triple directional. Are ocean waves purely bidirectional? Since containers hang onto each other even in heavy storms, would a similar secure locking mechanism be detrimental to a CLT modular unit design? Thanks. Um, I'll try to answer that, uh, I, th I think, to, to the best of my ability. Um, so there are vertical components to the, to the seismic motions that are possible. Um, and we've allowed for that in the, in the dead load uh, increase or reduction based on the codes, the vertical component that you add or remove from the dead load. Um, so we've considered that uh, because they're still quite heavy, there's, there, there's, they're still going to hold on to each other for some degree, but we, we don't want to lock them together. Um, we looked initially at having some placement pins um, and the like, and we may have something that allows a bit of tolerance, but we don't want to lock anything together because we have to allow some, some differential movement for the steel brace frames to work. On a shorter building where we do lock everything together, then absolutely we'd we'd uh, look at using some placement devices to really lock them in place. And that might help with the shear transfer. And then we just have some hold down connectors or something. Thank, thank you, Alana. We have several more that I'll read. The first, uh, this is from uh, Sushit Bandari. The first part of this is not exactly a question. Awesome presentation, Alana, Rachel, and Joe. I just wanted to say that. And then he said, I saw that ceilings were used as diaphragms as floors used thicker CLT than ceilings, wouldn't they be a better choice or even both? Is it because the difficulty in connection, is it because of the difficulty in connection between floor panels? Exactly, yeah, um, mm -hmm. that's exactly it. The, the floors would be advantageous because they're thicker, but the, seal, the ceiling panels work fine. Um, on, the, on the smaller project we're doing, on the, the three-story townhouse, we have 80 millimeter ceiling panels and that's getting really tricky for a diaphragm, but on site, you only have access to the ceiling panel. You don't have access to the floor panel. Um, and a um, couple more questions. I think most of these are for you, Alana. And um, we do tend to have an, uh, have an audience that is very heavily engineer focused. So um, Adrian Mitchell asks, how much redundancy from a structural aspect is the volumetric modular system versus a comparable flat pack CLT solution? And they clarify a little further down, the above question was in regards to your design solution. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this is a really good question because we're working on what our kind of internal policy on um, mm -hmm. progressive collapse and integrity for mass timber buildings are. Um, traditionally, like a post and beam CLT system has very little redundancy, like 
almost no redundancy uh, compared to a concrete building or a steel building where there's sort of in the design practices, there's redundancy built in. And I think this is something that the industry and, and we're going to be working on this as well. It, it needs to change. With a building like this, because you have so many bearing walls, you also have doubled up structure um, designed to support a failed element. There's, there's actually more redundancy than a typical post and beam or point supported CLT mass timber building. Yeah, Alana, as you know, I've, I've asked you that question on a different occasion about this question about redundancy um, because it relates directly to cost and these things are always a trade-off. And anyway, there's, there's another question here from Jeff Morrow, which is, can the spine located on the top of the modules withstand the heavy loads and avoid the potential for crushing? Yeah. <laughs> That's what it's there for, right? Is that yeah, it? it's, it, and, and this system is, in concept is designed to a higher building for this project. It's designed for five stories of, CL, of, of modular CLT. So for those loads, yes, it, it works. Um, for a taller system, we may need to reconsider a couple of things, but the concept is solid and, and we're not seeing crushing of that spline. Well, the next question is, is amazingly not a structural engineering question. You'll be surprised to hear. It's, um, has the construction of the Darrington facility gone out for bid? And do you already have a construction contractor on board? Um, there's a contractor. Uh, it, we're about to we're about to put it out for permit. So the elements have not necessarily been subcontracted or tendered out, um, but there is a project managing contractor who will be doing the site, and the concrete, and then Sticks Works will be doing the the timber erection, I believe. Rachel or Joe, did you want to add something? Um, no, I think Alana probably knows more about. Uh, the Darrington factory than I do, at least. Yeah, I was going to say if Craig Curtis was still on the call, he probably knows that answer best. But definitely, <laughs> I yes. think I think I think you're right, Alana. Yeah, I, I think Craig yeah. had to leave, and I think has asked for a recording. Which, and I think most of the people who come to meet up know that Evan um, will put this up as a recording. I think now, Evan, these go up in the Tallwood Design Institute YouTube site. Is that right? Yeah, as long as uh, everybody that presented is okay with it, I'll post it to the YouTube site. Right. We just need your permission and we hope to do that. So we seem to have, at least we've gotten nods and because we're recording this, we've got that on record. That's great. <laughs> okay, so there's a couple more questions. Uh, one from John Cooley, how will electrical be run in the solid walls and ceilings? Oh, that's, that's a question. good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, Rachel, do you want to take it or I can answer? I was going to say, we, we probably both know this all too well. Um, <laughs> uh, initially, the intent um, was that there's there's about a two inch gap between the floor and ceiling panels between modules, as well as between the mate walls. So um, the intent is that the electrical is running vertically through the, the wet wall and then would be routed um, kind of in those gaps between modules to get to the bedrooms at the exterior. Um, in spaces that aren't directly adjacent to the wet wall. Um, kind of later in the design process, uh, we also explored routing it um, just above the CLT floor, but within the floor assembly itself. Um, uh, you, you know, so then it still has to penetrate the wall um, either way um, if you're running between modules. And then you would have exposed conduit um, on the ceilings. Um, but we did get some engineering judgments to be able to recess the junction boxes um, within the, the walls themselves so that you don't have surface mounted junction boxes. Like it, the, the, the answer depends on how fancy you wanna get um, and how clean you want the final detail to be. But yeah, I think uh, we, we're, we're dealing with basically all three of those solutions. That's great. I, the, I like your use of the technical term fancy, Joe. Yeah. I'm sorry, we're yeah. going to elaborate that. Right. Oh, no. I, um, I, I, something I meant to mention earlier was just that the, uh, the floor buildup for acoustics is pretty thick. It's about two and three quarters inches. And so um, I think the, the most straightforward way uh, to run electrical, it would be, you know, surface mount once you come out of the floor, but you can run anywhere within the floor 
inside that two and three quarters inch floor buildup. Great, thanks. That's that's very useful. And, and Alana, I noticed your use of the term nuts as a technical term and yeah. the size of, of hold downs. And anyway, it's great to hear all these technical terms used. So there's a couple more questions if, if you guys are willing to answer. Is that is that okay? A little more time. So Benjamin Stinson asked a question. How do you manage fee in an explorative process like this? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. It's hard. It's uh, it's hard. I, I think um, like anything, it's it's good communication with all parties, um, understanding. It's hard to understand the scope of something that you're tasked with figuring out. And um, for all of these projects we're working on, it's not like you have a benchmark fee that you can go by and just say like, last time it cost us this much, so this time it's going to be the same. Um, so yeah, that's that's a that's a major challenge. And yeah, I, yeah. I was going to ask I, Joe if you want to adjust that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I actually don't know if I can speak to this particular project as I came in maybe in the middle of it, but uh, previous experience with um, experimental projects is you, um, you know, the last thing you want to have is a conversation about how that building or this building went up at this per square foot cost. Um, because, uh, you know, setting the expectation, uh, setting the expectation of a high innovation premium is essential for innovation. Yeah. But that, that's, I'll just plug us. That's, that's another reason that a partner with the Tallwood Design Institute or other such universities who do R&D, who can sometimes get grant funding or other things to work on these things with you. We'll, we'll just so, put that plug in, yeah. That's a great point. Actually, the fire tests, I believe, are uh, funded by a grant. Um, that, that's an, a very expensive thing that most projects would not take on. Yeah, and, um, and that's one of the things that the Tallwood Design Institute has done, has done a, a certain amount of research development and testing that becomes open source just to allow innovative projects to occur. Anyway, sorry for that plug because there's two more questions we should get to, but you know, it is our veto. You know. So um, uh, Maria Paola Riggio says, great R&D work and um, asked question, Darrington Wood Innovation Center will horizontally integrate downstream processes what about upstream and integration? How critical is early collaboration integration of other processes, e.g. enclosure system, MEP, et cetera? And I think you guys address that in-, in um... Yeah, it, it's central. It's mm -hmm. hugely critical. Like yeah. it, it, to, to, to look at this, this is a pure structural challenge it is absurd. Like it, it needs to be solved wholly, including you know, who, who, where is the enclosure coming from and who's, who's doing the MEP and how is that working on site? So there's one more question. I don't know if it'll be the last one. Is the cost, this is from Nate Peters. Is the cost increase from having a higher number of unique timber components tied to the added complexity for the manufacturer? I don't know. Hmm. I, I, I don't, I think that's a question I want to ask now to the manufacturer. Like I, that wasn't the message we've received during design, um, but I'm not sure. I, I, I think we've got some mixed messages on that where um, kind of the, the, I think the prefabrication world in general, their party line is, you know, variation costs money and brain power in the factory costs money and they don't wanna really have to think too much. Um, but yeah, I mean, if I, I think, you know, if you ask certain CNLT manufacturers, um, you know, how much does it cost to cut, um, you know, variations in every single panel, you know, any given variation doesn't really cost much. So it's, I, I guess it, it, it depends on how, who you talk to. Yeah, I mean, you have to program it, right? And that, so there, you have to at least pay for the programming time, but presumably the, the actual CNC time is probably similar. So those are probably the things that you have to balance. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's complicated. I, I once, once when I took my students to visit Freras, I, I asked how much they charge for routing. I, I didn't have a current number. I think it was $20 a minute or something. <laughs> it's an extraordinary amount of money. So 
those issues of um, you know how much you're routing, not not just uniqueness in the programming, but how much you're routing versus how much you're just cutting, all make a huge difference in terms of the of the eventual cost. Anyway. I'm sure somebody will want to do a costing study of this entire process and the project when it's done. Maybe somebody at our institute, one never knows. So I think, um, does anybody have a last burning question they need to ask? And um, um, no, the last comment uh, was from Nate, which is super interesting, thanks. And maybe that's a great way to, to leave it. I think it was super interesting. And um, and I hope everyone else found it so. I know that I, 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 I'm very interested in the subject. So I've been asking, um, people who I've heard give very, very interesting presentations to give them to our meetup group, but this was great. And um, we look forward maybe to a follow-up once the module is built and once more happens and you know maybe down the road, it would be great to hear about the next stages because it, it's such an interesting and innovative project. And, and again, thank you so much for you know, spending time to put the, pro the uh, presentation together and to uh, present it to us. Thank you, thank you all. It's been such a blast. Yeah, thanks for having yeah, us. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. This was a lot of fun. Okay. Bye. Thank All you right, very much. Up. And uh, we hope to see most of you at our next meetup. Yeah, see you next time, October 14th. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Great. Bye.